Hello, welcome back to Lead the Standard. I am still Kelly Taylor and you are tuning into episode 20 of Lead the Standard. Today we are talking about I've got my qualification, now what? We are going to answer that question for you today. As always, this podcast does extend from our Lead the Standard newsletter, and you'll find that I believe it is 67, which I may have accidentally ventured last week. That's all right. That happened (laughs) this week now. Um, Jackie and I are going to be jumping into this one. As I said, it is a question that so many of our students ask as soon as they finish their training. I've got my education, got my qualification, now what? So we're going to explore those steps and the opportunities that lie ahead and how you can apply that new found knowledge in real world situations. Jackie, you have some extended stories, I suppose, which can our students and our audience today can relate to. So would you like to share with us? Sure. And I suppose, yeah, the stories are all related to the same or similar situation so I suppose it just emphasizes that mm. you're not on your own yeah so okay it's and they're such a yeah. common question yeah you are not on your own it happens all the time so you know there is a solution to it it's just part of the process right so I was going to share with you well I'm not I am going to share with you um a bit of background with my training so in the late 1990s we're doing a lot of um sort of going back into the 90s at the moment um (laughs) maybe that's um, a theme for next week it must the 90s yeah so I was I was training um not in the ISO space um I was uh, like a first month support trainer for a software company um so when people purchased a point of sale and a back office um system set up um, on their desktop computers with floppy drives for backups. <laughs> I'll get Angus to put a screenshot of what a floppy drive is for anyone. Yeah, yeah, this is a this floppy conversation drive. Is <laughs> um, I, was, I, I used to train the business owners on the implementation of their, their, their business systems um, and reconciliation on the back office, as well as using the point of sale. So from that training with for the same company, actually, I went on to be the become the quality manager of environment OHS as well. So that incorporated some internal training also. So I became aware even at that early stage, even before I was training in the classroom, externally and public courses in ISO I became aware that like training is just part of it it was Mm -hmm. it's just that that first step so you know it's one part it's the first step so I regularly had um, contact from students afterwards and of course with the early days of training, that was just part and parcel of it. You trained them for the first month, but you also supported them throughout, which is a key part of that what now that you mentioned. I've got my qualifications, what now? So, or now what? Does it mean the same? It does. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm, you know, they, they constantly come to us, as you know, and say, look, I finished my training. Now what? And look, it's a hard, it's not straightforward because the answer, in my opinion, is it depends. It depends on what you want to do and where you want to head. It depends on where you are now. Like the training is just, as I said, the first step, or it, it's it's part of that process. So I do want to encourage or support you all. As I said before, you're not on your own even though it I said the answer is it depends <laughs> and it really isn't an answer um mm-hmm. I have developed a now what model I'm going to call it <laughs> I changed the name of it. Okay. <laughs> a very fancy name for that one. <laughs> now what model it means it means yeah, it, it has more meaning what? to it. I I will share my official name for it, but I like the now what model better. 
Before I move on and Kelly and I share the now what model, I do want to highlight, as Kelly said, these podcast episodes are an extension of our Lead the Standard editions. And in the Lead the Standard edition, which Kelly thinks is number 67. Look, the last two podcasts have given me the same information. So, oh, so maybe it's 68. So sort of look around 66, <laughs> 67, 68, you should be Just fine. Yeah. What now? Search what now? Yeah, or now what? <laughs> so you can tell we really don't know what's going on. But in that in that leader standard um article, I did share another external article um from HBR Harvard Business Review. And it was called Where Companies Go Wrong with Learning and Development. And oh my goodness, I discovered this thing in this article called the forgetting curve. Oh, I've heard of this. Yeah, I've yeah in, in the article, yeah. if you've read the article, Kelly, which you should have, yeah. in the article, I actually included the little forgetting curve graph that was in the HBR article. It is mm. really cool, but I suppose the core part of it was this German psychologist, Hermann Ebbinghaus, discovered this so through various you know, experimental studies, et cetera, um, mm. that he found that if new information isn't applied, there's the key word, mm. we will forget about 75% of it after just six days. Mm. What is going on there? Like that is mind-blowing. So we do all of this training, but if we don't start applying it, after six days, we're going to forget 75% of it. Yeah. It's like that is super scary. Mm. Mm. And that goes in line with, I know on a previous episode, you and I, Kelly, have talked about application and yeah. always needing, um, we talked about mentors because those mentors use it and apply it every day over a a lot of people they don't forget it as much and I mm. used my example I think last week with my business coach I was having a challenge that I raised in our session and I knew I'd already heard and read what her answer was but I'd forgotten about it yeah. so and that's okay that's why I have her to remind me <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're right like last week we were talking about how education is the foundation and, mm -hmm. and this is the same thing, mm -hmm. okay, build the found, building a house. You can build your foundations, but if you don't build the walls pretty yeah. soon, your foundation is useless. Yeah, absolutely. So when I read that, I thought, oh, my goodness, that's, like, mind-blowing. I would never have thought that. 75% you'll lose only after six days. And mm -hmm. there were other stats in there that talked about um, that only 12% of employees, 12% of employees apply their new skills that they learn through any learning and development programs. But only 12% apply it. Yeah. Like that's, that's a yeah, lot that's, of wastage in so many ways. Yeah. Exactly. And that's why the question of now what or what now is so important because really we we don't want you to forget no. we know you're not going to remember absolutely everything but we don't want we want you we want to increase that 12 percent obviously hmm. okay we need we need the the application of what you're learning and to to increase so you can it is beneficial so you can take it away and apply it so that's where the now what model <laughs> comes in which I've just renamed so I know Kelly likes me to give a short answer so I'll try now so the ISO application growth model or maybe as I said I might call it the what now or the now what model because it makes more sense it holds centrally the application of the training knowledge and then 
it shows the three three results or benefits of that application. So it could be just enhancing your current role. It could be transitioning to consulting or, you know, working for yourself, or it could be pursuing sort of uh, external certification auditing. You can see that application of knowledge drives those other areas. But the key driver of this application, though, whether you're working within an organisation as an employee, offering, you know, uh, going externally through consulting or auditing, the foundation is the same. So it's just effective application of the ISO standards that you have learned. So having this approach not only helps you, I suppose, obtain those practic that practical knowledge or insights into how ISO standards can be applied, but it gives you some sort of, what's the word? It gives you that knowledge, ownership to make improvements within the business that you are working for within the system. So by mapping these processes against ISO clauses, you can visualise more how you apply that theory into everyday operations of the business, into practice. Yeah. Before you move on to getting into how you do that, I just had a, I remember this, this is actually something I learned way back when I first started my career. Um, I worked for a real estate franchise and they were big on education. And one of the things, and I, we, we do it here too, it's only that you've mentioned this model that I've remembered the specific um connection and why we do it um whenever one of us went to training and we do it here as well whenever someone goes to training we here at Atoll have a Monday master and we used to do the same thing uh, at that organization as well but if you went to training or did a PD course when we had that next meeting it's good to share some of the key things that you have learnt because it's likely to be within that seven-day timeline. But then sharing that, those key points or the things that you really got out of that or mm. the things you're going to implement with others plants the seed for them but also drives it, well, drives the conversation, inspires those people to get on board and will drive them to likely ask you more questions about what you have learnt and oh why does it why does that happen what does that mean and again that reinforces and resets that time clock yeah so again yeah. you're more likely to retain that information as well absolutely and I know you know businesses probably implement that to make sure that they're getting People some are value paying attention. At, a, at ascending their staff on training and I get that from the time and money owners perspective yeah yeah but you're right it actually helps if that if you as the person attending that training have like you have that responsibility when you return back to work it does make you think oh okay I need really need to take note what am I taking on board what can we implement what are my actions from this training so how can how can the business benefit from it because you're going to naturally benefit from it anyway yeah but, um, yeah, that's actually a, yeah, a really, really good um, approach. I have come across a lot of organisations that do that. Mm. Yeah. But, again, um, sharing that reinforces it to you and, and gets absolutely. you. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah, because, because, you know, you're saying it out loud. Yeah. Isn't it funny how when you say things out loud, they make more sense or less sense. Or less sense. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And that's why it's good to say it out loud yeah. because yeah. then you can figure out, oh, does that actually make sense or not? Now Do what? I really know what, now? what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like, yeah. So, no, thank you for including that because I haven't included that um, specifically in this no. what now model that like the focus, and I know those of you that are watching this episode, you'll see the model, um, but there's sort of three offshoots as a direct benefit of the application, but we're focusing on the application um, in this instance. 
and we're focusing on the ISO world, obviously. So the application of um, ISO. So <clears throat> within within the business, so you don't forget, so that you are part of that twelve percent, and you can increase that percentage. So it does actually go in line with what you're saying, Kelly. It's about supporting. If you've done your training, now the, here's some ideas that I'm going to share as to how you can apply it. So if your, you know, if your organization does do what Kelly mentioned and you you do have to present and and apply, well, here's some ideas for you to focus on. All right. So there's five different areas. The first focus area to apply your learned knowledge is mapping the business processes to ISO standards. Okay, so the objective of this is to really identify and document all of the key processes within the business that impact or can be affected by the ISO standards that align with it. So align each business process with the relevant ISO clause. So you might have a mapping document for that. And then you can identify any um, existing processes that do match. You'll identify um, process owners of each process as well. So some sort of responsibility. And obviously, ultimately, you'll have that clause identification so you'll have a breakdown of your ISO standards and the clauses, and they'll map across to your processes. So then the output of that is it's a gap analysis. So you'll be able to then identify where's the gaps, where's the holes. I've got all of these procedures that align with these clauses. Here's the gaps. Okay. And obviously those gaps will then create further action. So it's a pretty simple mapping process. I actually think, don't we have a weirdly called template? Yeah, it's called. No, Free we, resources, the Atmel Business the Helper. I don't like that yeah. name. We've got that, but we do also have the gap analysis tool as well, which is less weirdly named and probably as equally relevant. <laughs> I like the weirdly named one, the Atoll Business Helper. Yeah. Which because is, you can just list your procedures like down in that left-hand column mm. and then then map it to the clause. Mm. Um, you know, either either or work. I feel the gap analysis is more like an audit you know, because you provide more information, which is fine because then you have your action. So maybe download both and see what um, suits you best. It might be good to put those links in the notes of this episode, Kelly. So Absolutely. there's sort of two resources there that you can use to initiate this first, um, I suppose, focus area, which is just simply mapping what you know in the business to the ISO standards and clauses. Now, Kelly, because you built both of those resources, is and mm. without going into too much detail, because I know you include instructions or whatever, do you have anything to add to this first step? No, I think, look, is that both of those tools we've tried to make as simple and, and easy to follow as possible um, because for the most part, they are going to be used by people who are at this stage. I've just got my qualification. I'm really excited. I want to apply it. Let me yep. start somewhere. And it can be overwhelming mm. to go too far into that space. So just baby steps, baby steps. Um, but again, they're also designed to be used by somebody who's got no idea here as well. And it, obviously a bit more context if you've got your qualification. But I think you're right you've got that understanding or that education, as we said, that foundation um, of the systems or the standards, et cetera, and now you're beginning to be able to understand and apply that with some context. Mm -hmm. um, you could definitely do these things before your training, but you'll probably be lacking a bit of context. Yeah. Actually, that would be a really interesting exercise, actually. Do one of these things, do some training, and then redo them. And see yeah. if you get a different outcome because you have a different understanding and a different interpretation of the requirement. 
Yeah, I think we've had a lot of feedback over the years of people that have actually commented on that is that after they've completed the training, they have a, and I love that word that you use, context, because then mm. they can go, ah, oh, uh-huh. that's what it means. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it gives them that context. So I do like that addition, Kelly. Thank you. Actually. <laughs> so that's, and Kelly will put the link to the tools um, in our podcast notes, whether you're watching it or listening, the um, links will be in there. So the second focus to apply your learned knowledge is Create visual process maps so you can develop like visual representations of how the processes currently work and then where they might intersect with ISO standards. You might do this with the gaps only or for all. This might be a flow chart or diagrams. I'm just saying it needs something that's visual. So mm. it, you might work visually, others might work visually. Well, while you're doing this, you'll also identify those integration points. So you will you can mark those specific points where they cross over in the process and you might find there's multiple links as well because that is the beauty of an ISO standard. So there's multiple clauses that, that are integrated, so you might only need to do something once. So those might be where decisions are made, I normally find more so that crossover or where things are most likely to fail are where it gets passed from one department to the next. Yeah. This to me is really important and having been the... I say having been, I'm I'm in the process of handing these, these over to other people, but having been the person responsible for our processes um you write there in that there's the one thing to write everything down and there's a, another to do it visually and it's really apparent as your team grows and evolves um the different ways that people learn things but i do this all of the time whenever i'm creating a a workflow and you Absolutely right, Jackie. The biggest gaps are where a process goes from one team to another, particularly where those processes are developed independently. So, uh, yes. Yeah. So, mm. the customer service team's roles and responsibilities include this, and let's do right out their process. But then the training and assessment team do this. And whoops, there's a gap. Who does the bit between here and here? Does this person hand over to this person or is this person expected to pick this up or do they both do that? Sometimes you'll find there's a a double up. But I always, um, and it's it's a really, really simple tool. I open up PowerPoint only because it's got a little bit more flexibility than Word and I'll use their smart um, Mm their smart charts or smart art yeah, smart and create art. a flow chart um, or an all the, the hierarchy charts. This step leads to this step, which leads to this step, which connects to this step. Look, it doesn't have that exact functionality. But for me, I can see that as a big picture and I can go, okay, yep, this is how that works. Oh, okay, there is a gap here or yeah. this this needs to connect to this. One thing that I really love and we're working on at the moment um, in our specialist courses is we have those inputs, outputs in a more visual format. The And and it is a list format. It's visual but it's still a list. And the Mm -hmm. reason that we've done that is because, as you said, there is so many things that connect to connect and we tried doing a, a lovely flow chart but we might as well have given a pen to a toddler and just said, just mm-hmm. do some scribbles and there are all these connections. So you might need to do a couple of graphics, but this will really simplify your understanding of how yeah. your business works. It doesn't need to be all that detail. It can just be a simple 
flow chart this to this to this yeah. or this links to this yeah, yeah. um yeah. I'm glad I've got you here because you're cleverer at doing that sort of stuff than I am and you did remind me that um, a lot of procedures that I review during audits they could they actually have a combination they have like the the process flow of the procedure initially on the first page and then they document it so it allows people with different ways of reading or following procedures to use either or or a combination. And as you said, with the process flow, they can have that overarching look at, oh, this, and it's more so who's responsible. Now it passes here and now it passes here. Mm. Um, I've also seen it, and this is where I've actually found it most beneficial is, what do they call it? It's like where the ball, like, boards like swim lanes I think oh, they're yeah. referred to in Visio maybe I used to use Visio for this um is Visio still around I think it is it's a Microsoft product I but they have those swim lanes and we used to have in each swim lane the department that was responsible so then we'd have the process flow so it might start off in department A and they might do a couple steps, then it will move to department B, then it might come back to A, then it might go across to C. But visually you can see the responsibility and that's by following that sort of visual, um, that's where I learned, as, as you confirmed, norm normally the failure point is where it changes hands. Yes. And that's yeah. a communication thing as well. Yeah, it could be uh, well uh, outputs. So as you know, uh, someone else's outputs become the next person's inputs, and we know that here. Um, mm -hmm. If if we're landed with a task through our Asana projects, but the previous um, person hasn't provided the information that we need, which is their output, then we can't do our next. Yeah, so you know, that process needs to be refined to ensure that they are in the best position to give us the outputs. Well, their outputs are the best outputs they can give because we need it for our inputs, you know, and that's that's clause 4.4 4, um, as well, outputs and inputs and their inter, I think they call it interaction or interrelationship, something like that. Mm. So that's a really good way of mapping it out. Yeah. It sets clear, clear guidelines for everyone, mm. um, but mm. also I think opens a bit of opens or creates that opportunity for more open communication because people know who to go to for that information. That's a good point. You would yeah. like to think that it would create a bit more ownership and oh, hang on, I yes. need this. But it 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 allows for people to go. Okay, I know where to go. I'm not just going to go. I'm going to sit here and wait until the information is hand fed mm. to me. Oh, I need yes. to do my task yesterday. I'll actually go and ask such and yeah. such. All that. Yeah, you, yeah, you know who's responsible before and after, if needed. Does Asana have this view? I was just thinking. Uh overall, in part, I, I don't believe so. Um, look, we we have our our board view. Um, mm. They are. They are, well, I don't want to be an, a, a walking advert for Asana too much. They are wonderful. I love them to death. There are, I'm actually, look. Yeah, I, I thought you were now. looking. Because yeah. program, they, they have a program which sort yeah. of. The timeline, yeah. They are building things. And look, at the level we're at, we're obviously a small business and I know that there are some ex Exceptional features available to people who are an enterprise that I am tremendously oh, okay. jealous of um, because I'm a little bit of a nerd when it comes to this stuff. But yet, look, the workflow and the boards kind of work, but they're not as as transparent mm. and open as they could be. Mm. Um, we've got mm. calendars, we've got timelines. You can look at different teams and individuals workloads but yeah you it can. doesn't have yeah. that so here's an Mostly. idea we have not built built a, an asana project with the boards based on responsibility can i remind everybody <laughs> that this is a podcast but um, welcome no, to I'm, jackie's bright idea session <laughs> 
<laughs> this is what happens well, in my everyday is, life. No, this is, this is where they have, and, and yeah, I'm just putting it out there. Okay, no, let's do I'm it. Putting it out there because it might address some of the challenges we're having. Yeah, insertion. Yeah, so there's an there's an idea. I, I was going to go and get my Jackie's bright idea candle that you gave me, <laughs> but I'm just putting it out there. So. You can see by having a chat to someone, <laughs> you can come up <laughs> with different ideas and it is very visual, which is exactly what Kelly and I have just somehow demonstrated. Audibly. <laughs> yes. So you're right then, Kelly. It's great. Oh, we're sharing, we're sharing the natural process with people. Yeah, we are we have our qualifications and now <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting because you're you're really highlighting exactly what we're talking about uh, earlier. We've we're both Asana ambassadors. We have done all of the Asana training. We're heavily involved in that. I've been on two weeks leave. I did some Asana training before I before I went mm -hmm. on their new features. I didn't apply it over the two weeks. I'm having no. to refresh my so memory. You've forgotten it now. Well, seventy five percent of it is gone, yeah. Kelly. Yeah, and I'm guessing the older you get, the less you remember. <laughs> <laughs> all right on track Jackie on track okay okay I'll move on I think we did really good with that one okay <laughs> sorry oh, look at this for a segue okay oh it is too yeah so guess what the third focus area to apply your learned knowledge is engage with the process owners so collaborate with the people who are in charge of each of the processes. So you know that you're understanding the process um, enough, well enough. You need their input because that's the only way you're going to come up with improvements. So you can either do this in a you know, one-on-one -on -one environment. You could have it in workshops. So with all of the process owners for each of the areas of responsibility, um, and then once you've identified it, you'll just continue to work together to refine and adjust the processes so that you're filling the gaps that you've identified initially. So it drives that continual improvement. It, it, it drives improvement opportunities that others are also a part of and can identify themselves. So look at the the practical application by doing it that way. It's amazing. Mm. Mm. And I think, yeah, by engaging the process owners, again, you can share your newfound knowledge with them and how see how they can apply that or how they have applied that themselves, how that can be used to improve the process. And I suppose when we're talking about process owners, by default, I think a lot of us think the person that wrote the process, but mm. the process owner is not necessarily the, in my mind, the process owner is not necessarily the person who wrote the process. It's the person who does it day to day to day. Um, is responsible uh, for it overarching because there could be, as we've discussed, multiple people involved in the process. Mm. But there's obviously more than likely someone or a team that's responsible for the overarching. Yeah, yeah. Who who are responsible for impl? What's the word? Oh my gosh! Implementing and actioning that process. Yeah. Um, because look, and I'm going to steal a bit of a regular story that my father tells me he tells a lot of stories actually he doesn't tell a lot of stories he tells a lot of the same stories a lot of the time on repeat <laughs> I do love you dad um, hi dad but, <laughs> but um he's retired now he's got some extra time to listen to us um <laughs> the, one of the stories that he tells he is a former military man um and he was a very late starter to get into like he was in his I'm going to actually, he was in his late 30s when he enlisted. So he was not a young guy out of school, just doing what he was told and listening and following the rule. And I know the Australian um, military is very different to other 
uh, countries as well. So the, the experience will be different. But he was in his late 30s when he joined. So he had a bit of worldly knowledge. Yeah. Having conversations with him recently while I was down there, I'm very aware that my father probably could and should have been an ISO auditor. But, <laughs> it's um, never too late, Kelly. No, well, he is now. He's retired and for his second time. Um, no, you no going through. Uh, but he would see, particularly as he was transitioning out into retirement from the um, from the army. And I think we've had a student, and you'll know who I'm talking about, but I won't mention his name, who's had this same experience in that. The people who are living and working this military lifestyle or these changes are being told what to do by people behind desks in a completely different state building who have never experienced what they're going through, what they've done, how the real world works in that context. So, again, that person who's writing that process, and, and this would apply to you as you've got your qualification. Just because you have that qualification doesn't mean you have all of the knowledge, experience, you can write all of this stuff and that's how it happens. You need to engage with the people that are yes. going to be doing yeah. it to make sure yeah. that that is the reality, it is actionable, it is, yeah. it's realistic. Yeah, I like that word. That's this is the reality. Yeah, it just doesn't happen. You and and it comes back to people. I think in a previous podcast we talked about that. The people are the biggest challenge, really. Yeah. You have to get them on board. And so that's where that suppose focus comes in, engaging with the process owners. Like that's one of the principles, um, is engagement of people. Mm. So don't forget about that. Yeah, be open-minded, be transparent, yep. be open to improvement. Just because yep. you have the qualification doesn't, doesn't mean you know it all. No, and everyone's just going to listen to you. That's not how it works. No, that is the real world. <laughs> That's right. As you said, reality. Yeah. So moving on, the fourth focus area to apply your learned knowledge is to document the findings and develop action plans. So you need to create a clear, actionable plan based on all of your previous, so your mapping um, across from your procedures to your your clauses, um, any gaps that you've identified. You might have an output that is a report. It might be a gap analysis, um, as what Kelly mentioned earlier. But basically, you need an output from your mapping to, to, I suppose, formalise, okay, this is the plan. These are the actions that we're taking. And I, I guess you should also include who's responsible for each of those actions as well. Yeah. So you can see that the previous um, actions or focus areas by the time you get to here, you should have an idea of what your actions are. You're not just, you know, get walking around, having a chat, talking to people. Oh, yeah, there's a gap, there's a gap. You'll remember to do that. That's not how it works. We, mm-hmm. we need to formalise it so you have this um, clear action plan. I always like to think when, when you're doing this sort of process, it is essentially a, you're doing an internal audit. So don't waste the opportunity to record it as an internal audit. And these action plans could be a part of improvement opportunities or non-conformances identified. So then you have this evidence to demonstrate, you know, even if you're not certified, you'll have this evidence to demonstrate these improvements and these gaps that you've identified and these were the corrective actions. Don't ever waste that opportunity. So it it ensures that these things get done. That's where I was just about to say, by formalising it and sh- and sharing it, I think is probably more important, make sure it gets done. We had a joke yesterday. <laughs> We've had this joke before about, post-it notes but again Jackie yesterday you had a procedure written down on a piece of scrap paper Jackie lost this piece of scrap paper 
I have until it. later I found on. It she, now. Yeah, she found it, but not when she needed it. <laughs> but if Jackie had formally documented that process in our procedure document, look, it was a personal piece of paper, not a professional, but that piece of paper only means something to Jackie in Jackie's hand at that time. But if it had been in the improvement register or documented in our procedures document in OneNote, in one then it note. wouldn't have been mm-hmm. lost and it would have been I actionable. looked all in those places because I thought that's where I would have put it. Yeah, but you didn't. I did So that's that's what we're saying here about, yeah, document the findings, but make sure you document them somewhere that's accessible, locatable, maintainable, all of those things. Um, Absolutely. Not just to yourself. Like, yeah. Again, we're talking Asana. If it's just relevant to you, you can have your private board mm-hmm. or you can put it somewhere. But if if there is just that slightest chance that somebody else is going to benefit from that or may need that again in future or, heaven forbid, we want a promotion and we want to hand over our task to somebody else, if it's there, then it's there. You don't have yeah. to hand over or remember all of these things later. Yeah, she absolutely. says that she's looking at her old school to-do list in front of her today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure your old school to-do list is an extension of something oh, from yeah. elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. my priorities out of my mm-hmm. documented, like, yeah, my documented oh. to-do list. But yeah, yeah I think that's right. That's really important is, yeah, while documenting the findings and development of plan is one thing, sharing it, is the one thing that we haven't quite touched on there. Yeah. I think it's really important. So you'll love the next one, Kelly. (laughs) And that's the fifth and final focus area. I'm going to say that again because it's like a tongue twister. Oh, wait till you say the last word of the next one. (laughs) (laughs) The fifth and final focus area to apply your learned knowledge is all about monitoring and reviewing and providing feedback. So this isn't done once. It's a continual cycle. So you've mapped your processes against the ISO standards. So this is applying your knowledge in the real world. You've involved people in the process. You've documented any actions as an outcome, that's not the end of the story, okay? You need to continually review. So, and I've mentioned this before, it could be through um, planned audits, so audits scheduled at different times. It could be feedback loops. So you could have weekly meetings where you review those actions and see what the status of those um, actions are. You'll be sharing then any updates or documents or any changes that have been made so this drives that continual cycle and that continual improvement okay I was going to say you've created a monster but it's a nice monster yeah it's a friendly monster because this this mapping is something that you will end up continually doing it's a continual cycle and this fine this is that final loop that will help you to, by by this time you get here to this stage, because remember this is all about applying your knowledge, you will know so much more. You will have remembered so much more and then this just becomes part of your day. Constant reinforcement. Yes. Yes, that's, yeah. And, And also though, Kelly, you're learning more as you go so don't think that all you're going to learn is what you learned in the training Mm. yeah like yeah application of it the end yeah Yeah. it you it's like mind blown because you you by working with other people identifying the gaps it's a continual learning process yeah you're you're learning from that application you're learning from other people's experiences you're learning what does and doesn't work you're learning what is and is not relevant you're learning what can be done better mm-hmm. what yeah there's there's so many learning opportunities yeah in 
continuing to work through this. But again, that you know I love that word, feedback. I am not ashamed to ask for feedback. No, you're not. You're very good at that. Yeah. Um, and again, you, getting that other people's feedback, you're going to be able to see, again, how other people have understood and interpreted your newfound knowledge, um, see how that benefits them. You'll, I suppose, be re, what's the word I'm after, reassured that your mm. qualification and your time was well spent. Yeah, yeah. Because while as business owners or managers, employers, there is an element of I've spent $1,500 on five days out of the office, so that's actually this much money because I've got to factor in wages. There's a bit of pressure on the employee or the trained person to demonstrate the value in that. Yeah. And this, this is where you're going to see that. You're going to get Absolutely. more bang for your buck by applying. Yeah. yeah, you'll sort of feel, I don't know, more satisfied. I don't know if that's the right word, that what you've learned is the right thing now that you're applying it. Imagine the con- well, not imagine we know. Think of the confidence boost that when you get oh, to this point. Oh, I love point, that word. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, six weeks ago I had no idea, and now look what I've done. Yeah, and sorry, does that answer the what now or now what? I think so. Look, for, for mm. this particular for this mm. particular option, as you said, the, it depends. Is a really because I think we could write a few different articles around this, but this is a, around applying it. This is about it, applying it. This mm-hmm. is the point that you're going to see that. Yeah. Um, but as you said, reviewing and I like to, we do this with our um, our last student, our lead order to skill set, the Australian Nationally Recognised quali- uh, Qualification. In their first observation, they do a self-reflection. Yeah. And I can like most of them say, oh, I could have been a bit more confident. I could have prepared better. Mm-hmm. I could have asked this differently. I could have done this. That's their first one. They have a few other workbooks and then they do their next observation. How often is that second reflection? Oh, I prepared much better. Yeah. I I took yeah. on board the feedback. Oh, I did. Like there's chalk and cheese. Yeah. So this is, a, I suppose, the equivalent of that, seeing where you come, where you're at, and then continually. Yeah. But they've also gained the confidence in the first one. So they understand yeah. now how it works and what's expected of them. So until you do it, you won't find that out. So it's always yeah. about just taking that first step and you can see that your confidence builds from there. Mm. And yeah. I think it's important at this point, if you do get to step five, the monitoring, the reviewing, and things haven't worked out as you mm-hmm. expected don't get hung up on that. It's just yeah. that didn't work in this instance. Yeah. We know that didn't work. Bonus, we've learnt that now. Yeah, let's, let's try something. It. It's an opportunity to try something else. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. don't don't be hung up on the the failures because they're not failures; they're opportunities. Yeah. Absolutely, I like that. So I might recap. Yeah, let's jump see in where we're at. Yep. So. That's the five focus areas on that application. And as I said earlier, no matter what direction your career path is going, this application is key. So these are just a few things or five things that Kelly and I you know, shared for you to focus on to help you with applying what you've learned. So those five areas were a bit of a process map. Um, so like a, gather gather your, your procedures and match them across to the ISO clauses. You can then decide to make a visual process map. Okay, Kelly and I talked about, um, I call them swim lanes, but process maps as well. The key thing being normally the challenges or issues are normally at the crossover of responsibility. Mm-hmm. Um Don't forget to engage with process owners, include them in the process. Um, Number four is document the findings and the gaps and 
the and develop the action plans as well. Consider it like a gap analysis or an internal audit. And then finally, always loop it back to monitoring that mapping, monitoring those action plans and that feedback constantly. So that's the five areas that we covered. So as always, before I hand it back to Kelly, I'd like to close with stay curious and always lead the standard. By staying curious and leading the standard, you'll continually find new opportunities for growth and excellence in your career. Thanks, Jackie. Um, so yeah, that does wrap up today's episode, which was based on I've got my qualification now what, and particularly around applying your newfound knowledge in your business. I uh, said so there's some really good points there for us to look forward to in the future and talk about as well. So we do hope you found that part of this conversation very valuable. Remember to join us next week when we will be discussing uh, Lead the Standard 68. I can confirm, I did check, next week is 68. Mastering boundaries and how these are the key or this is the key to your success in auditing and consulting. I think mastering boundaries is the key to success in life, I think. So I'm really looking forward to this one. But as Jackie said, until next time, keep leading the standards and we will see you then. Bye for now. Thanks for joining us once again as we lead the standard. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast for more episodes just like this. And don't forget to leave a review if you found today's episode informative and inspiring. If you're already an Atoll student, remember participating in live Q&A sessions just like this is one of the exclusive perks of your enrolment. And if you're not already a student, join us at our website, www.auditortrainingonline.com to learn more about our courses and how you can start making a difference in your career in ISO management system standards. So join us again next week as we not just meet the standards, but we lead them.